All right, so I need a little crowd participation before we get started. Uh, I want some people to shout out, where is your favorite place that a crowd may gather? Any th- Church, okay. <laughs> Sunday school answer, good job. What was that? Football stadium, okay. Hiking trail. Hiking trail, yep, seen some crowds there. State fair, good. Those are all some great examples. Uh, but one thing I noticed is no one gave an example of a crowd where the leader is being arrested, <laughs> right? That's not usually the place that we wanna be. But that's exactly what we dive into here in the beginning of Acts chapter four. And before we jump into that, just a quick review of what we've covered so far. So in chapter one, we saw that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, had promised that the Holy Spirit was coming. He promised that to the disciples and then he scoots on up to heaven to hang out with the Father. There's 120 disciples left in the upper room. They're looking at the free agent market, trying to find a replacement for Judas. And then in chapter two, the Holy Spirit does come. And Peter gets an opportunity to preach his first sermon. Because of an act of God, because of them going out in the streets and speaking in tongues, a crowd gathers, Peter speaks the truth, and 3,000 people give their life to Christ on that day. Chapter three, as we talked about the last couple weeks, and if you guys haven't heard those messages, I encourage you to go back and and listen to Pastor Ryan's words from uh, first two sermons of chapter three. We see another act of God and another opportunity for Peter to preach a message. A lame man who had been lame since birth for 40 years was laying out by the temple, and Peter and John come up to him, and in the name of Jesus, they heal this man. The guy was rightfully stoked. He was excited. He was jumping around. He was hugging Peter and John, and a crowd gathers around. They've seen this guy for 40 years, and all of a sudden, he's doing cartwheels and getting excited. What the heck is going on? They're excited about this. And so Peter, again, second opportunity to preach a sermon similar to the first and gets a similar response. We'll get to that here in a minute. But as this crowd is gathered, as he's preaching, here's what happens. Read with me, starting in verse one of chapter four. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So Peter is standing there preaching and uh, some jelly bellies, as the kid would say, some jealous people are over there getting really annoyed. They're not happy with what is being shared. And this annoyance is likely for two reasons. Okay, the first reason is that there were some unauthorized people there preaching, right? They weren't scheduled to come up in the morning. They weren't scheduled to be there sharing this message. And so they were annoyed by that, rightfully so. But the second reason, and this is a a very wrong reason, is because they were preaching a different message, right? They were preaching the message of resurrection. So the Sadducees, that's, that's one of the three people that we see there. They're Sadducee because they don't believe in the resurrection. In fact, they didn't believe in anything spiritual, supernatural at all. And so as Peter and John are saying something different theologically, they're very upset about that. Greatly annoyed, in fact, is what it says in verse two. Then we have the priests, right? Again, they're upset because this is their turf and they're preaching on it. Not happy about that. And then third, we see the captain of the temple. So this would be like our security team. The guy who is overseeing what happens, has the authority to to make decisions there. So picture me standing up here this morning and our pastor team and our security team and some other theology buffs come and tackle me. They cuff and stuff me and they take me off, right? Would that make you guys very ready to believe anything that I would have to say? Probably not. Well, maybe so here because I'm preaching from the word and that's what we believe in here, but these people, they maybe wouldn't have been too willing to listen to this message. And in fact, mid-sermon, as he gets the hook, right, it says, came upon them in verse one, which I think is an understatement. I picture more like a scene from cops, like bad boys, bad boys, you know, cops. Tackle them, wrestling them, pull them away. But guess what? Verse four. But many of those who had heard the word believed the number of men came to be about 5,000. Can you imagine that? Right? It didn't matter the scenario. When God has a message of truth going out and he wants to move, he's going to move. 
And so the church grows to 5,000, and this is just men, right? It says 5,000 men. So we can guess there's maybe closer to 10,000 people, women and children included. I just wanna say this for any of us, maybe in this room who think that big church is a bad idea, I challenge you to take that up with the heavenly father, right? This is what he planned out for us here in Acts. But also, uh, just a little side note, it wasn't just about the quantity, they were also worried about quality of disciples, right? This wasn't like a altar call, let's leave them, they're on their own. No, the reason that some scholars think that there was 5,000 is because they all showed up for Bible study that night, right? They were meeting daily, they were committed to the teaching of the apostles. So that night, all those people were there getting discipled. So as we grow, as we get excited for all the things that God is doing, adding, we continue to wanna see quality discipleship and that was modeled here in Acts. But all that to be said, here's the first point I want us to take away from this passage. And that is that we should expect persecution with Jesus. This past Wednesday night at, uh, at our youth group at Harvest Students, we were in Luke chapter four and uh, the title of our message is Jesus is Offensive. So Jesus was in the synagogue. He was reading from uh, the scroll, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, he said some things that got the crowd a little upset. And so they chased him and they're ready to throw him off a cliff. All right. He faced some persecution. And in fact, in John 15, he warned us that if he was persecuted, then we should also expect persecution. All right. This is what Peter and John were expecting. They knew this was coming. Right? They didn't get scared and run away. And there's lots of passages in scripture that tells us that we should expect persecution, but there's two uh, that we went in depth a little more with the students on Wednesday that I just wanna share with you this morning. So the first one is 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 John 3.13 says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So there are always gonna be people who don't like the message of truth. There's always going to be people who are perishing around us and consider Jesus folly and his message folly. But the second part in John 15, verse 20, after he says, you can expect persecution, is played out right here in Acts chapter four. Because after Jesus says, you can expect persecution, he says, also, you can expect people to obey your message just as they have obeyed my message. Amen. Right? No matter what, we see here, we have an altar call as he's getting pulled away in cuffs and people still give their lives to Christ. That is the power of God. So again, we should expect that persecution. Jesus promised it and it's going to be coming to us. Peter and John weren't discouraged by that. In fact, we see the exact opposite as this cop scene is taking place, they're being drug away. There's still some boldness going on there on their behalf. And that's our second takeaway point for this morning is that we should boldly speak of the power of Jesus. Peter and John didn't flinch at the opportunity to share the gospel with the crowd, but now it takes a little turn, right? It's not just the crowd anymore. Let's read here verses five through seven. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? So the law was that they could do no trials after dark. So that's why they got to have a sleepover in jail that night. And uh, this isn't just some regular old court, right? This is the who's who's of Israel. This is like the US Supreme Court equivalent. The elders, the scribes, the rulers, this is the Sanhedrin, right? This is 71 guys who were the top of the top. This was a theocracy. So both the religious leaders and the political leaders were the same people. That's who these two fishermen get pulled into to talk to. And so here's what happens in verse seven. They're in the midst and they're asked, how did you heal this lame guy? Right? What, what power did you use here? These fishermen, they're not the brightest guys, right? They hadn't gone through schooling. Sure, Peter's been preaching and seen some success, but that's been with common people out in the streets. Now he's like equivalent of in a Harvard lecture hall, talking to a group of brain surgeons about neurology, right? 
Maybe some of you here are neurologists and you would feel comfortable in that situation. Most of us wouldn't. Um, but I also picture this being a mismatch, like my one-year-old daughter being thrown on the any professional sports arena, right? It probably wouldn't go very well for her. This is what the world thought of Peter and John in with the Sanhedrin. It wasn't gonna go well. But Peter didn't feel that way. Look at verse eight. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, still being respectful in his tone towards them, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Boom, give me some of that, right? That is some boldness right there. That is awesome. Now, let's break this down a little bit, okay? Four traits of boldness that I wanna touch on that Peter exhibits here. Okay, the first trait is that he is saved. Salvation. It doesn't explicitly say that in this passage, but we know that Peter and John recognized their weakness and their need for a savior. They had surrendered to Christ. Their boldness came from a place of weakness, which is so countercultural to what the world would tell us. Guys, but think of it like this. We're all created in God's image and there's a, a throne in your heart that he made just for himself. And if you haven't surrendered to Jesus, you're sitting in his chair and he's not super excited about that. Let's be honest with ourselves. If we're trying to be king or queen or ruler of our life, how is that going for you? Probably not very well. Guys, admitting that you need God to be in charge is actually a huge, huge blessing. Think about it. If there's something terrible going on in your life with a relationship, with finances, physically, whatever that is, and you're sitting on your own chair and God comes up to you and says, no, you're good. This is great. You're doing awesome. Where's the hope in that, right? It gets no better from here. But if you respond to a message of truth and say, yeah, yeah, I am in the wrong chair. Yeah, I am bad, but God wants to come and take the seat and make things better. Man, praise the Lord. Accept our weaknesses, accept that we need save, and that'll give us a trait of boldness. The second trait is that we should be spirit-filled. Right, right in verse eight, it says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter before he spoke a single word, allowed the Holy Spirit to fill him up. So those of us who maybe are already bold in this room or who desire for more boldness, we should pray, Holy Spirit, fill me up. Fill me up as I speak of your power. Third thing, studious, right? A bold witness is a studious individual. All right, Peter wasn't just talking from a, a place of ignorance, in fact, he shows that off a little bit in verse 11 as he quotes Psalm 118, 22 there. Right. He had spent some time studying. In fact, three years with Jesus, learning from him, both academically and experientially. Right. Education studies, I think, are best if it's also experiential and not just educational. And so, as he quotes Psalm 118, he makes a clear statement that Jesus is the chief stone, the Messiah, the Lord and Savior. And the men who stood there, they recognize this, this ordinary guy, right? Verse 13, these ordinary men. Man, there's something, there's something unique about them. They spent time with Jesus. Think about that. Does our lives cause people to turn around and say they've been spending time with Jesus? They've been studying him, experiencing life with him. What an awesome goal for us to strive for is to be studious in Christ and that'll increase our boldness. And then the last thing is to be sure, a sureness. 
Being sure helps us to be bold. Verse 12, this is one of my favorite passages I've had memorized since back in the day in Awanas. There is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Praise the Lord for that, right? But don't be wishy-washy about your words, right? Don't say, oh, it's okay. Whatever you wanna do is okay. Don't tippy-toe around trying not to hurt somebody's feelings, right? There's a throne in your heart that is for Jesus alone. Don't mince words. That's boldness, and that's what Christ wants for us. And the response of the Sanhedrin is, is awesome here. They were astonished. And in fact, verse 14 says they had nothing to say in opposition. They couldn't even come back at him. I love that. But they sent Peter and John out, and look what happens here in verse 15. So sad. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. I read this and my heart just breaks. They, they recognized the truth. In fact, in verse 14, it says the lame man who was healed was standing right there with them. The evidence was right in front of them. They didn't deny it. They had nothing they could come back with. But yet, their response in verse 17 is, let's, let's just keep this from happening again. Let's not have it spread anymore. I'm just like, what, what are you doing? There's this, uh, this video on YouTube. It's a, it's a caption of one of the announcers of ESPN. Uh, it's a soccer announcer after the U.S. didn't make the World Cup, and he was a little upset. And he's just like, what are we doing? What are we doing? We should be there every year, blah, 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 blah. And I just, I get this guy's heart as I'm reading this, like, what are the Sanhedrin doing? Are you kidding me? These are the guys who should be representing God to the people. They should be so ready to receive this message. Yet their minds are closed. Their hearts are closed, right? Our heart and mind are very similar into an umbrella in that if it's not open, it's not working very well, right? They were so prideful, so closed-minded. But I think this is something that we reflect a lot of times in our lives, stubbornness, and that's what brings me to our third point today, which is that we should humble ourselves to the pardon, the preaching, and the practices of Jesus. God promises that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We will be humbled before God. It's just a matter of if he humbles us himself or if we willingly choose to be humbled. And so uh, I can tell you that it's gonna be better just to make that choice now, loved ones. And there's three things that we should humble ourselves to that I wanna to touch on, and that's the pardon, the preaching, and the practices of Jesus. And I paired each P word with a T word that hopefully helped us uh, with some memorization. I feel that that works well. It helps me anyways. And so when it comes to humbling ourselves to the pardon of Jesus, it's this word, tameable. Right? Tameable means to be rescued from a state of native wilderness. So think of an animal that's pulled in and made tame. Guys, our native state is death and destruction and sinfulness. And we need rescued from that. We need tamed from our own natural ways. We talked about this. We need saved. We need God to sit on the throne of our heart. I've heard Matt Chandler say this quote in a sermon before, and it stuck with me. He said, the declaration isn't that we are innocent of guilt because we are without a doubt guilty. But the declaration is that God has pardoned us from the offenses of our sin. We need to be able to surrender to God and to make ourselves tameable, to accept the pardon that he wants to give us. He wants to forgive us of our sins. The 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 verses where Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made great in your weakness. It goes on to say that, uh, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All right, when we are weak, that's when God is made strongest. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be tamed and claimed by Jesus Christ. And that's easier said than done. Because then it comes into our next point, which is that we need to be humble in Jesus through being teachable. 
So that goes back to the preaching of God's word. We need to have a humble willingness to listen to the preaching of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14 talks about that words that are imparted from the Bible are not human words, but spiritual words of wisdom. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So if you are not listening to the things of the word being preached, you gotta ask yourself, do I have the spirit within me? These 71 guys, they recognized the evidence right in front of them, but they counted it as folly. Indisputable evidence that they couldn't even argue themselves. But they aren't feeling convicted. Their hearts aren't changing. And instead, they just huddle back up and say, how can we get Jesus now? His whole life, that's what's been going on. They've tried to ask him a question. He answers him in love and shuts them up. And they go back and huddle up. Okay, we gotta do something else. How can we go get him now? Instead of responding with repentance and belief, they weren't being humble to the teaching of Jesus Christ. Lacking teachability keeps us from growing in Christ like gravity keeps us from flying. Right? We need to be teachable. If we're unteachable, two things have happened. Either we haven't originally given our lives to Jesus, we're not found in him to begin with, or we're choosing to stay grounded when he wants us to soar. He wants our lives to be full of joy, to live how he made us to live. That's not that it's gonna be easy, but he wants to fill you with joy if you would be teachable to the things that he has in his word. So one thing I wanna challenge you guys with today is find someone who is close to you, maybe a spouse, a great friend, a spiritual mentor, your small group leader, and ask them, am I, am I teachable? How is my teachability? And then be ready to receive whatever they tell you, right? That should be something that we desire is to be teachable, to listen to the preaching of Jesus and of his word. That's why God has placed spiritual leaders, teachers, preachers, small group leaders, mentors, friends, accountability in our lives. The Sanhedrin, they were missing out on that and they're missing out on the blessings of God. Which then, our third trait of humility is to be transactable. Okay, so these 71 dudes, they weren't trusting the parting of Jesus, the pardon of Jesus, excuse me, they also refused to be teachable to the truth of Jesus, which ultimately leads them to an inability to be used by Jesus in any way. So transactable, yes, uh, I'll confess, I think this is a made up word, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it works really well. So transact, it means to conduct or carry out business. So being transactable is the idea that you will be a vessel that is being used conducting business for the heavenly father. Second Timothy 2.21, it says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, ready for every good work, right? We wanna be prepared workers for Christ. We wanna be mobilized to do work for the kingdom. We wanna be transactable for Jesus. It seems really simple, but uh, I struggle with this at times. It can be easy to accept the pardon. I'm, I'm covered, right? I'm forgiven, it can even be easy to, to be teachable at times, to learn things. But then we wanna go and God asks us to do something. That's where we maybe pump the brakes a little bit. Uh, Pastor Ryan sent uh, a YouTube video on a text this week that I thought was really good and kind of captured this point well. Uh, some of you guys may have heard of Francis Chan. He's a, he's a famous pastor, uh, awesome writer, great man of God. And uh, he talks about the easiest game in the world, which is Simon Says. Everyone know Simon Says? Okay, not enough hands. We're gonna play a little bit here this morning. So, all right, follow me. Simon says, pat your head. Go ahead. Simon says, stop. Simon says, stomp your feet. Stop. Oh, see, I didn't say Simon says. Okay, you guys get it though. That's good. That's good. All right, so he, he explains the game and then he goes on to say, uh, I do this with my daughter. I tell her to go and clean her room. And she goes, okay, dad, I got you. And I come back, see her room later and it's not, it's not clean. I'm like, Rachel, what's, what's up? Your room's still dirty. Oh, Dad, I remembered what you said. I memorized it. I had, a, I had a group study to think about what it'd be like to clean my room. I even know in Greek how to say clean your room. It's awesome. It's funny to think about that. But sometimes as disciples of Christ, we do the same thing. 
We don't allow ourselves to be used by God. We'd rather study, we'd rather think on it, we'd rather just fill ourselves up instead of doing what he wants us to do. God says. Moses in Exodus is an example of this, of being slow to be transactable. I'm gonna use this word as much as I can today while we're on it. Okay, he was slow, but God ultimately used him in amazing, amazing ways. Jonah, we went through a, a sermon series on Jonah not too long ago, same idea. He was a little slow, uh, had to sit in the fish for a little while, but ultimately God used him in some great ways. Isaiah in Isaiah 6 talks about, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't, I can't be used. God quickly changes his heart to say, send me, I'll go. I'll go do the work. Later in Acts, we're gonna see uh, Paul says, I wanna be a vessel to do the work of Jesus. Jesus himself in John 17, as he's praying before he goes to the cross, he says, Father, I've done the work that you've given me. Jesus himself was transactable for the heavenly father. So think about this. What, what have we been sent to do? Right? We've been sent to go and make disciples, to love God and to love others. So ask yourself, how are we doing on that today? Will we humble ourselves to the practices of Jesus? Will we humble ourselves to the preaching of Jesus? Will we humble ourselves to the pardon of Jesus? These 71 dudes, the Sanhedrin, they heard the truth, they recognized the truth, but they didn't believe it. They didn't wanna act on it. They failed to humble themselves. Let's not be like these men. Let's not look back at our lives and have someone say, what were they doing, right? Don't do that, right? Because humility reminds us of the hope that is in Jesus, right? Our weakness is his strength. Not in ourselves, not in man, but in God. The Sanhedrin, they, they still aren't getting this. They're not humbling themselves. In fact, verse 18 again, we see that they just said, don't, don't talk about Jesus anymore. Don't do anything in his name. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them. Uh-oh, here we go. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Peter and John say, sorry, bros. We gotta talk about Jesus. We gotta do his work. We can't help but speak about him. All that we've seen and all that we've heard, is it better for us to obey God or to obey you? You be the judge. Right? The Sanhedrin's hoping in themselves. They're not hoping in Jesus. Verse 21 says, when they had further warned them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened, for the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So as the apostles get sent out, they get one last warning, don't do that anymore, that's not good, all right? But the crowd of people, they remembered why they were there in the first place. They were there because something awesome had been done in the name of Jesus. These Sadducees, these priests, the captain of the temple, they had walked by this man every day for 40 years and nothing had happened for him. One day, in the powerful name of Jesus, and he's changed forever. He had placed his hope in Jesus. Peter and John had placed their hope in Jesus. These people in the crowd who are praising God had put their hope in Jesus. Guys, that's what I want us to do today. Our final point is to place our hope in Jesus. Let's place our hope in Jesus this morning. See, we talked about true boldness and we talked about true humility, but sometimes that gets us in a wrestling match with the world, right? What is true and what is not true? The world would say that true boldness and true humility don't look like what we read in scripture, right? Sometimes we put our feelings, we put our own personal values, we put our hope all in man. We don't put our hope in Jesus and things that are eternal, and again, I'm not standing here saying that it is an easy thing to do. It is not, right? We want to be liked by people. I wanna be liked by people. I trust that you wanna be liked by people. There's nothing wrong with that, right? If you don't wanna be liked by people, uh, you probably aren't liked by people. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, there's nothing wrong with desiring human relationships, friendships. But what the problem is, is when we make Jesus an add-on instead of a takeover of our lives. He's not just something extra on the side. He is our only hope. 
Jesus Christ, no other name. When we're more afraid of our family, of our friends, of our neighbors, of parents at our kids' games, of whoever sits next to me in school, of a coworker, we're not putting our hope in Jesus. We're, we're being fearful of man. John 12, 42 through 43 tells us, I have it up on the screen for you. It says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. So these authorities are believing in Jesus. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And sorry, I typed the, right, or the wrong reference for you up there. John 12, 42 through 43. Do you know someone who fits this description? They love the glory of man more than the glory of God. Right? They're not placing their hope in Jesus. They're letting Jesus be an add-on instead of a takeover. Loved ones, we gotta stop placing our hope in worldly things. It's, it's ridiculous. We need to place our hope in Jesus. He's solid, he's firm. And there's joy in that. So I have a story I wanna share with you, read to you. It's of uh, two soldiers who were serving in World War II together. One buddy was shot in the leg in his femoral artery, and he was bleeding out on a stretcher. He was brought to the med tent. His friend followed him. The wounded man knew that he was not going to make it. He was losing blood far too quickly. So he asked for a pen and paper and shakily jotted down a note. He gave the note to his friend and he says, hey, when you get home, give this to my dad. So he dies. The friend survives the war. He gets home. He's looking for his friend's dad. He finds him. He walks up to the door, prepared to give him the message. The father sees him as he knocks on the door and opens it. And the veteran says, this is a note from your son. He was my best friend. He asked me that I give this to you. The dad opens it, tears already rolling down his face. And here's what the note read. Dad, I love you. And I know that you love me. I know that you would do anything for me. I'm so sorry I'm not coming home. I can only imagine the reception I would have and all that you would do for me to welcome me back. But my friend who just delivered me this letter, would you treat him as you would have treated me? Would you act as a father to him? Celebrate his return as a hero. Give him shelter, be an ear to hear, pay for his college, go to his wedding, take him into our family. Love him as you would love me. Guys, because of Jesus' death, we have the potential to be adopted into the family of God. Our heavenly father wants a relationship with us. Jesus' death gives us an opportunity to have relationship with our Heavenly Father. We can place our hope in that. That is a sure thing. And unlike this story, the son who died is no longer dead. He is risen. He has been resurrected. He defeated death. And with confidence, I can stand here and tell you today, he's coming back again someday. Amen. So it's fitting that as we focus on hope today, in this Advent season, we know that we aren't wishfully thinking. We see Peter and John weren't wishfully thinking in the inaugural persecution of the church, but they humbly and boldly placed their hope in Jesus. That's where we place our hope today. The one who we're here celebrating, worshiping, learning about today in Jesus Christ. So I ask you again, where's your hope today? 